Hey guys, welcome back to The Historian's Craft. Um, so, many of you have seen the, or one of the most recent series I put up, um, and which, at the time of this recording, has two episodes left that I need to edit and actually upload, um, and that is The Fall of Rome, The Catastrophist View. So, what that series was doing uh, was following the work of an archaeologist named Brian Ward Perkins, and it was really examining the notion, or the, the argument rather, the uh, interpretation of the available evidence, to suggest that when the Roman Empire ended in the West, around 500, it really was something of a collapse uh, and a calamity. What I want to do in this series, which is both a standalone thing and a uh, companion to the previous one, is look at one of the other ways of viewing this whole time period, and that is one of continuity um, and transition, not necessarily decay and destruction. So to do that, the first thing we have to do is talk a little bit about uh, some of the historiography for this thing. So historiographically, the most important work probably on the late Roman Empire ever written is Edward Gibbon's The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Now, it was published between 1776 and 1789, so roughly contemporaneous um, with the events of the American Revolution. So, I'm just throwing that out there so you all get an idea, kind of like when this thing was really getting put out. Now, it was published at the end of the 18th century. It had an influence that was felt in late Roman and Byzantine studies for about 200 years, up until really about 1960-1970. Um, so, in many ways, it set the quote-unquote conservative view of dealing with the late Roman Empire and the subsequent Byzantine Empire, or Byzantine phase of Roman history, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, basically, it was that the empire declined, it fell, and then European and Middle Eastern history transitioned into the medieval period. It was an age not really of enlightenment, it was an age of religion and uh, darkness. Other works, however, began to push against this paradigm. So in the 1920s, James Bagnall Burry publishes uh, two books on the history of the later Roman Empire, which have more of an Eastern focus, more of an Eastern Mediterranean theme. Um, but part of it still goes into this whole idea of decline and fall. You have the myth of Rome's fall in uh, 1962 by this scholar named Haywood. So by that title, what we're kind of grappling with at this point, and this is because stuff like archaeology has advanced, etc., um, is the idea, well, maybe there was some destruction, Maybe it was kind of bad, but there was also a lot of continuity. However, this whole idea of transition and continuity, not decline and fall, really gets its start with um, the publication of Peter Brown's The World of Late Antiquity in 1971. So as a counter to Ward Perkins's The Fall of Rome and the End of Civilization, what this series is going to be doing is largely moving through The World of Late Antiquity, in addition to some other books, um, to examine what continued from the Roman period into early and high medieval Europe. So, the key point with late antiquity um, is that it tends to focus on stuff like religion, so Christianity, Judaism, uh, and Islam, and on intellectual history and on philosophy, so not really politics and war. It uses politics and it uses war as a shall we say, a, a frame or a spine on which to construct its research and its narrative so we have a, a decent uh, chronology going, but it's not really its focus. The key point, though, is that you can read a book on late antiquity, and for example, Peter Brown's The Rise of Western Christendom, which is up here somewhere, um, does this. You can read a book on late antiquity, and you're able to read a continuous narrative of Roman history from about 200 to about 700, 800, 900, 1000, depends where you want to put the cutoff date, um, that does not really include politics, war, 
or sharp breaks or destruction, but still makes sense. So it's possible to view the period as one of transition. This is something that's not easily done with other historical time periods. So for example, you can't write a history of Europe in the 20th century without World War I, World War II, or the Holocaust. It's not possible. But you can do this kind of stuff with late antiquity because we have a plethora of sources available to us and because the evidence suggests that there was a great deal of continuity. So this is how um, the book is kind of broken up. So part one tends to focus on the late Roman Empire. And you will notice if you're looking at the titles of all of the chapters in it, it basically focuses on early Christianity and a lot of philosophy. Part two, Divergent Legacies, focuses on, well, we have the West, and then we have the East. And then we have Arabs and Islam coming in somewhere. So it uses politics as a way to, again, construct its spine. But the emphasis is on religion, Christianity, and philosophy. So with that being said, um, there are numerous ways, and this probably is not a surprise to those of you who know your history really well, there are numerous ways um, of interpreting the history of the Roman Empire, especially the late Roman Empire. One of the ways in which you can kind of interpret how and why it developed along the course that it did is that the Roman Empire, its core was the Mediterranean. Yeah, it went into Europe, the Near East, Britannia, etc., but its core was the Mediterranean. It expanded around that sea to absorb and thus to protect um, what we basically understand to be like classical civilization or the classical world. And in doing so, it unites, you know, broadly similar cultures, Greek, Roman, Hellenistic, uh, Judaic, Egyptian, etc. So all of these were broadly unified by their geography, centering around Mediterranean, um, shared history, they had a shared history of interaction and, and uh, diplomacy in many cases, especially after the era of Alexander. Non-Greek areas were governed by Greek dynasties, by Greek families. So uh, Ptolemaic Egypt, for example, is a pretty strong one that comes to mind here with Cleopatra and everybody else. So all of these areas are broadly united by shared geography, shared history. So in many ways, their life was similar. Uh, they ate similar foods, olives, wine, etc. They have similar deities. Uh, there are similar government types. Some of the city-states have republics or democracies. Some of the city-states have monarchies. Some of them are not city-states, but they have monarchies, etc. And it's further unified by the impact of Hellenism and the Alexandrian conquest. So the issue, though, is, well, once Rome, once Rome conquers this region, the Mediterranean, and you expand out into Europe, into the Near East. How do you maintain this culture, this lifestyle, based on the Mediterranean, once the empire is no longer focused on the Mediterranean? Like, once it expands into Gaul and Britain, how do you do that? This is the main issue here. Um, so, the late antique world inherits this classical legacy, this idea of classical civilization, and it inherits this problem that classical civilization was trying to deal with. And as we're going to see, the late antique period tackles this question in its own somewhat unique way. Another way of interpreting late antiquity, well, not necessarily late antiquity, um, classical civilization, ancient history in general, especially the Roman Empire, is via population statistics. Now, that's not to suggest we have a lot from antiquity. We really don't in terms of um, stats from the ancient world, but the generally accepted ratio by scholars is something like 10 to 15, although some would maybe put it as high as 20 uh, percent of the population lived in cities. Something like 85 to 90 percent lived in the country. So you can view this period with this world as one in which 
cities predominated and one in which cities every year ransacked the country to feed themselves and left everybody else to starve. And because the cities survived, not these poor farmsteads, um, the legacy of Rome is one in which, according to Peter Brown, and I think he partially hits the nail on the head here, it's one in which the smaller number of people, so city dwellers, left their mark on Europe, and associated with this is the, you know, unsurprisingly, the, the cost of food. Mediterranean life is centered on sea transport. With the technology from the Roman era, we've been able to estimate you can travel the sea in any direction in about two to three weeks. When you go inland, though, that situation changes immediately, um, as does the cost of transport. So this is one of the things that Chris Wickham calls the weight of empire. Um, it's a massive empire. It has immense costs. It has immense size. Because of that, it moves and it changes relatively slowly. Yeah, there are wars and upheavals, but culturally speaking, it's a behemoth that kind of moved like a glacier. But when it moves, you know it moved. So, just going along with everything I've said so far, what I've done is I have kind of tabulated a list of as many cities as I could possibly find founded by the Roman Empire. So, I'm doing this so you all can get an idea of one, how long-lasting the civilization was, and two, simply how much construction and how much engineering the civilization did. This was really quite a monolith. Now, once you get past the sea and you're inland, um, yeah, you have some roads that connect the empire together, but it's not completely connected together. Mediterranean cities, uh, they're pretty closely connected. They're within relatively similar geographies, and they can get the items they need, whatever it is, from all over the region. The inland towns... Not so much. There are roads connecting them, uh, but they tend to be spread somewhat far apart, at least in comparison to the Mediterranean cities, in drastically different geographies, and because of that, they usually get their goods from a radius of something like 30 to 40 miles. So, the Roman Empire, then, was always characterized by dualism, towns versus cities, Mediterranean versus continental Europe, and then in late antiquity, it's going to be paganism against um, Christianity. So, the book which we're pretty much following for this series, The World of Late Antiquity, is broken up into nine chapters. Hypothetically, I could then break this up, um, I guess, into nine different videos. However, I thought a lot about it, and I decided that I'm not going to do that uh, because the topics are complex. So, I think they're going to get better treated in shorter, much more uh, numerous takes. So, this series, like I said, is going to be a counter to Ward Perkins' um, Catastrophist Viewpoint. And after this, after we get through the Catastrophe Viewpoint and the Continuity Viewpoint, we're going to get into another way of understanding the end of the Roman Empire, which is that it accidentally offed itself. That's going to be a somewhat bigger series, because it's not necessarily the domain of, like, one major scholar. It's a whole bunch of people kind of working together collectively to propose that idea. Um, so the catastrophe viewpoint, like I said, focused rather heavily on archaeology, politics, and war. This series is going to be more along the lines of religion, art, and culture. Um, so this has been the introductory video. Um, until the next video, guys, take care, and I will see you all then.